these are there to go. I, I'm the, no, no, by the window. Hi, Yuri. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see everybody. Morning, Jessica. Good morning. Good to see you all. Hi, Jessica. Yes, great seeing everybody. All right, so I think we'll get started. Um, so good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Shannon. I am the chairperson of the New York City Local Early Intervention Coordinating Council, and I would like to welcome you to our first web-based LEICC meeting. As of May 15, 2014, New York City's local law number 103 of 2013 and the New York State Open Meetings Law requires open meetings to be both webcast and archived. This meeting is being recorded today. I'm going to review some of the procedures uh, for the LEICC meeting. And for in-person LEICC meetings, attendees should pre-register on the New York City Department of Health Early Intervention Local Early Intervention Coordinating Council webpage. For the webpage LEICC meeting, attendees will find a link on the NYC Department of Health Early Intervention LEICC webpage. Meetings are open to the public, but the audience does not address the LEICC members during the meeting. For the web-based meeting, we will not be using the chat or the Q&A features. Instead, for this web-based LEICC meeting, members of the public were asked to submit written public comment by emailing Aristellus Rodriguez at A R O D R I G U E Z five at health.nyc.gov. Public comments will be read into the record at the end of this meeting. LEICC members will raise their hands instead of raising their cards to make comments. Also, a transcription is available for this meeting. Written meeting minutes will also be made available. LEICC members, would you please uh, introduce yourselves? Uh, I guess we'll start with Roseanne. Hi, I'm Roseanne Saltzman. Um, I work for Up We Grow, and I'm here today as an LEICC member. Great. Thank you. Um, and Caitlin. Hi. Hi, I'm Caitlin Moore. 
and I uh, work with the uh, DOE Division of Early Childhood. And I'll Caitlin. be presenting later. Hi, Caitlin. Caitlin's not an LEICC member. She's just pre presenting with uh, us. Uh, okay, great. Sorry okay. about that. So, it's okay. Uh, everyone, no, no, I'm the one who will introduce you. I'm going just in order of my participants. So, all right, Kathy. Kathy Ayala. You, we can't hear you, Kathy. Uh, I'm I'm Catherine Ayala, the director of the Staten Island Regional Office of Early Intervention. Okay, great. Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Treber. I'm the Associate Executive Director for Children's Services with the Interagency Council. Liz. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Leone. I work at Brooklyn College. I'm a parent representative. Jessica. Hi, I'm Jessica Wallenstein. I'm um, at the Department of Education Division of Early Childhood. Mary McCord. Mary, we can't hear you. Oh, she's having some. Okay. Okay. She'll come away. Okay. Let's do Simone. Hi, I'm uh, Simone Hawkins. Hey. Um, I'm Simone Hawkins. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Child Care at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Thanks. Right. And then Sonu. Hello, good morning. This is Sona Sanguli. I'm the clinical director at Achieve Beyond. Okay, great. Thank you. Mary, are you? We'll come back to Mary. Yeah. I think you're reading her bio later, so. Right. Okay, great. Excellent. Um, so before uh, we begin, I would like to make a statement as the chair of the LEICC meeting. Oh, Jackie, I think we missed um, Sundari. You want to introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. That's okay. Can't hear you, Dr. Perry Asomni. Hmm. Oh, there. Okay, here. Yeah. Um, um, I guess. Does that work? Yuri, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning, everybody. My name is Yuri Pollock, and I work at the New York City Administration for Children's Services. Okay, great. Okay. That's Mayor, okay. Dr. Perry Asomni, um, or how, how's your, how's your uh, audio? I think my audio, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'm Mary McCord. Uh, I work at New York City Health and Hospitals. I'm a pediatrician, um, and I'm currently at the Gouverneur site. I'm about to transition to the Sydenham site in Harlem, uh, but I also play a role across health and hospitals coordinating the primary care pediatric team. Okay, great. Dr. Perry Asomni? Did you, how's your audio? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Sundari Periyasami, general pediatrician from Harlem Hospital. Thank you for being patient. Uh, I seem to have some technical difficulty this morning. Thanks. That's okay. That's, that's, the, that's the nature of the beast. It's okay. Yeah. No, thank you. Great. Okay. Um, so these past few months have been extremely challenging for our hearts, minds, and spirits as we've coped with both the COVID-19 crisis and have mourned the countless the murders of George Floyd, 
Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and the countless lives lost to and the suffering caused by systemic racism, injustice, and violence. I want to take this opportunity to affirm that we, the New York City Local Early Intervention Coordinating Council, stand in solidarity with the Black community and the countless protesters in New York City and around the country in demanding racial justice and reform for the betterment of all New York's black and brown children, their families and communities. We have a strong commitment to ensure equitable early intervention services for our city's most vulnerable infants, toddlers and their families of all racial, ethnic and linguistic and socioeconomic backgrounds and that all infants and toddlers with disabilities and their families must have equal access to high quality EI services from culturally diverse providers who engage in best practices that include relationship-based and culturally responsive family-centered care and children's natural environment. Birth to three is such a crucial period for development and all children should have the same opportunity to grow to their best potential. This is the mission of Part C IDEA Services. Now, over the past few years, the Bureau, with the support of the LEICC, has been focused on the disparities we see for black children in referral and retention in the program. And although several initiatives have been introduced to improve participation of black children, there is still a lot of work to, to be done. What's happening in New York City right now is creating new opportunities for partnerships and advocacy which is particularly critical as we're balancing health and safety during COVID-19 with critical outreach and equity efforts. While today's agenda is focused on issues related to COVID-19, an update of the Bureau's initiatives to enhance equity, access and retention of black families in the early intervention program will be presented at the next LEICC meeting. Um, so I, share we all share and I want to thank all the members and LEICC committee just really um, pushing for these initiatives and um, leadership of Lydia and Dr. Casalino um, making much of this at the forefront of our efforts which needs to again continue now I wanted to um, I, will, I want to present our two, two incredible members that we've got who briefly introduce themselves. First, Dr. Jessica Wallace, Wallenstein. She is the Senior Director of the Children and Disabilities Birth to Five, New York City Department of Ed, Division of Early Childhood Education. And in that role, Dr. Wallenstein oversees the division's strategy for providing special education services to the city's youngest children. This includes the DOE's collaboration with DOH-MH Early Intervention, the district's, sorry, the district's portfolio of preschool special education programs, and the development of initiatives to support families and educators to access and create inclusive, high-quality early childhood education options for children with disabilities. Prior to working at the DOE, Dr. Wallenstein worked in numerous policy research, instructional coaching, and teaching roles in New York City. She earned her BA from the University of Chicago, her MS in elementary education from Hunter College at the City University of New York, and her PhD in education policy from Columbia University. So welcome, Jessica. Would you like to say a few words? Um, thank you so much, Jack, Jacqueline. Um, just happy to be here and excited to continuing to collaborate with all of you in, in this new role. So thank you. Great. Well, our next um, new member is Dr. Mary McCord. She received her MD and MPH degrees from Columbia University. She did her pediatric training in the Babies Hospital, Harlem Hospital Combined Residency. She is currently the Director of Pediatrics at Gouverneur, part of the New York City Health and Hospital System. She is also the clinical lead at the Health and Hospitals for Pediatric Ambulatory Care. Over 30 years as the primary care pediatrician in New York City, five at H&H &H and 25 at Columbia, 
where she worked to improve clinical services to vulnerable children using community partnerships and population health approaches. Since arriving at HNH, she has focused on the integration of a two-generation approach to early childhood pediatric primary care, working on this at Gouverneur and with the New York State Value-Based Payment Pediatric Primary Care Clinical Advisory Group and the first 1,000 days on Medicaid initiative. This focus integrates multiple early child support programs into the pediatric primary care. In her clinical practice, Dr. McCord has a special interest in children with special health care needs. Uh, Mary, would you like to say a few words? I uh, know I just would say the same. I'm excited to be part of this group. I think that the work that early intervention does is really important, and this focus on disparities is really important. Um, and I hope that I can help uh, think about how pediatricians um, can work with other members in the EI community and the community in general um, to uh, improve outcomes for children and access for children. Yeah, no, you're, the two of you are a great addition to our committee, so welcome. Now we're going to move on to approve the minutes for the last LEICC meeting in November. After someone makes a motion to approve the movement, um, Aracellus will state the name of the member, and then the LEICC member should state if they are in favor or opposed. So does anyone want a motion to approve? Catherine. Second. Second. Great. Thank you. Paris Ellis. Yes. Yeah. So Catherine Ayala. Do you are you in favor, opposed, or abstain abstain from approving the minutes? Yes. Kara Chambers. Approved. Are you in favor of both? Okay. Um, Simone Hawkins? In favor. Elizabeth Leon? In favor. Mary McCord? In favor. Yuri Pollock? In uh, favor. Sunzari Periasami. Sunzari Periasami. In favor. Great, thank you. Sonu Sangoi. In favor. Jacqueline Shannon. In favor. Christopher Treber. In favor. Jessica Wallenstein. In favor. Okay. That's it. <laughs> um, and Lydia Lenyak. In favor. Okay. Great. Thank you. So now we will move on to our agenda, and we'll start with our Assistant Commissioner, Lydia Lednyak. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to present on a couple of items today. Uh, we're going to make some a staff announcement. Uh, then we are going to talk about the SEICC. Uh, and then we're going to talk about, um, which I'm sure a lot of folks are interested in hearing about, uh, sort of what our programmatic response and modifications has been uh, during COVID-19. And, and, and I will provide an overview of the return to in-person services action plan. So I want to start by, uh, you know, making an announcement and um, this has been really challenging, a really challenging time for the Bureau staff. Um, our colleague Maxine Wilson passed away uh, during this time due to personal health issues. Um, they were not related to COVID, uh, but 
Ms. Wilson was the director of staff development and our outreach unit. And she worked in the Bureau for 20 years where she found great joy in helping children and their families. She was a dedicated and committed advocate to promoting and enhancing health equity and access to the EI program for all New York City families. Um, and Maxine presented to you on several occasions about our various um, outreach and equity efforts. And so I felt like it was right for, for, for us to share this with you. Um, this has been really difficult for us as a bureau because you know, she was such a good friend and colleague to so many of us. Um, and we really didn't have an opportunity to say goodbye to her or get closure. Um, but she was so loved and so respected and admired um, because she was so supportive of the program and of the families and of all of us. So I wanted to honor her and acknowledge her contributions to, to our program. I also want to acknowledge that so many of us have lost people um, and because the, the toll has been so great because of COVID. And I just want to say that while we all have to be physically distant right now, I just hope that we will stay emotionally connected to support one another as we live through these difficult times. Chris, did you want to say something? I think that was from before, sorry. Okay. All right. So, okay, let's move on to the report on the uh, State Early Intervention Coordinating Council, which happened on June 10th. So the, the state agenda was, um, it was an interesting meeting because it was also web-based like this. And so the feel of the, different, of the meeting was quite different. There was a lot of advocacy that went on during the meeting, which I will, which I will tell you about. So the Bureau presented on um, items that you see before you. The items that I will be specifically talking to you about are going to be the, their administrative updates, an update on the early intervention hub implementation status, which, as you recall, is the case management system that is supposed to be implemented to replace our current case management system, NICE. Um, and also, I will provide an update on the provider workforce capacity task force. So, as far as the Bureau's um, administrative updates go, they provided an update on all of the guidance that they have issued uh, during COVID-19, which includes allowing providers to deliver EI services utilizing telehealth, uh, the consent that they put out for the use of telehealth, and the FAQs that they published around COVID-19. Um, the June 30th, 2020 transition accommodation was also discussed. It was specifically raised by several State Early Intervention Coordinating Council members. So, as you may or may not know, the State Department of Health, um, in response to a lot of advocacy by a lot of folks, including municipalities, allowed for children to remain um, in early intervention if they were turning three between April uh, 2020 and June, the end of June 2020, but for for system issues, they were not able to be found eligible uh, for the Committee on Preschool Special Education. So for those families, they could remain in early intervention until June 30th. So the, uh, the State Early Intervention Coordinating Council made a resolution and recommended formally to the State Department of Health to continue and extend that time period until August, 31st. And just as a 
a note to that, there has been a significant amount of advocacy around this issue uh, by provider and advocate coalition groups, by municipalities, by a lot of folks who believe that they, that this time frame should be appropriately extended until um, the end of August because we we don't want system transition issues to impact families' abilities to get EI services this summer. So I will leave it at that. I actually think that one of the public comments that we got today um, also talks about that as well. Okay. Um, next, the um, State Department of Health uh, presented on the EI Hub implementation. Originally, the implementation of the EI Hub was planned for um, October 26, 2020. And, you know, the municipalities, the providers all felt like that was too soon given the magnitude of what we're dealing with right now because this will be a complete overhaul to all early intervention business processes and operations. It would potentially fundamentally change everything that we do. And so the state at the meeting uh, announced that they were moving the implementation date to May 2021, which is excellent. It's still, it seems like a long time, but it's not. It's going to be still going to be pretty tight for anybody that has implemented a large electronic systems can tell you, you know, a year flies by real quick. So um, at this point, the state plans are, um, are to hold virtual focus groups with stakeholders across the state, convene forums, and initiate user acceptance testing. And I very much encourage if any early intervention provider gets invited from New York City to do user acceptance testing to please accept those offers and invitations. We, the, the Bureau will be participating in user acceptance testing of the new system, and that will be really our opportunity to ensure that the system works in a way that supports the scale of the New York City Early Intervention Program. Obviously, they're also going to be working on developing training and resources, and they will be doing additional surveys um, of providers, municipalities, and anybody else who has a stake in utilizing the system. Um, in fact, I believe the state just released another survey around transportation and respite. So, you know, provider community reps out there, please um, reinforce uh, that everybody in New York City should try to complete these. Okay. So I, the last thing that I want to talk about is the Workforce uh, Capacity Task Force. So the Workforce Capacity Task Force was formulated in order to come up with a policy um, recommendations that will build the early intervention provider capacity. Um, so the work, the work group priorities that the, this work group specifically identified is around conditional approval and the review of the 1600 hour requirement that independent providers need to have in order to operate independently in New York City. And also what are the service delivery methods and models to enhance capacity to deliver early intervention services to underserved areas and zip codes. Uh, the work group recommendations that were made, I think, are very important to uh, bring up here. The work, book, the work group formally asked that the State Department of Health amend their regulations to reduce the 1600 hour requirement by a third to 1000 hours and um, to specifically identify training requirements by identifying the core competencies for professional practice in early intervention in New York State, which 
as you all know, New York City has been talking about what are the core competencies for best practice in early intervention for a very long time. And we are hopeful that the state and this committee will utilize the core competencies that we have developed over the years with our academic partners um, and potentially um, whatever modifications need to be made to them, that's fine, but we will finally have a professional of a standard for what professional practice should look like in early intervention in New York State, which you may be surprised, but such a thing does not exist. So um, we're very excited that the committee made this recommendation and um, our uh, one of our work groups um, of the LEICC has been working through the core competencies, has been developing man a manual for, um, for field work placements, for professionals in early intervention provider settings. And so I think all of that work can be, hopefully can be leveraged to impact and influence sort of what, that, what those expectations are at the state level. The work group also recommended uh, that the state formally explore teletherapy as an additional and permanent service delivery method in early intervention. In response to these recommendations, the state um, early intervention coordinating council voted to recommend to the state to amend EI regulations to reduce the 1600 requ hour requirement and to add telehealth to the scope of the provider work group capacity committee. And I think that that's going to be great because it's really going to tie into a presentation that you're going to see a little bit later on, which really talks about the efforts that we're going to make here in the city to evaluate the effectiveness of telehealth uh, for families and for providers and to really assess is it right for all for all service types? What kind of additional help and assistance do providers need in doing effective telepractice? Um, and so we're hoping to take that and potentially uh, leverage the work that we've been doing here to inform the state level discussions as well. This is great. Lydia, can I ask a question? Of course. Yeah. So um, just now, now that there's some funding going towards early childhood centers just through COVID-19, I'm wondering with the workforce, if there's a way to advocate for um, some of those supports and we're gonna be wanting to diversify, there's recognition of the need to diversify um, at the state level, early interventionists in different communities. And so are there, are there funds to have you know, early childhood teachers in the communities, you know, paid to take courses or to become the future early interventionists. Is that something we could be advocating for? Do you have any idea? I think that that is something that should be advocated for. <laughs> I, I think that we have, um, we, need, we need a diverse workforce and we need to expand the EI workforce. I, and I mean, in terms of specifically if there are dollars for the thing that you are describing, I, I am not aware of any in particular, but that doesn't mean that they're not out there. Okay. But I think there's a good opportunity um, to really explore this um, now. Right. Okay. Great. Thanks. Roseanne? You had your hand up. You're on mute, Roseanne. Okay. Oh, Chris. now I've been unmuted somehow. Okay, thank there you. you. Go. Uh, um, the Workforce Capacity Task Force is doing great work, so thank you. That's wonderful to hear. Um, I was just wondering, so June 30th is like upon us very quickly, right? Um, do you think that there's any... Um, 
thought that maybe in the next few days they may expand and authorize those children to continue until August 31st. Chris, do you want to share your perspective? Um, sure. So I think that um, I think that one of the challenges has been um, that effectively evaluation shut down roughly on around March 18th or whenever the programs closed. And for a period of almost three months, there were no evaluations taking place, even of the children transitioning from early intervention. And so it's created this backlog. Most programs are now doing remote evaluations, but remote evaluations take a lot longer to schedule because you have to schedule each individual component separately with the mm -hmm. family. Um, and then um, putting it all together and then getting a meeting um, is a challenge. So um, I'm going to um, make a proposal, um, a request to SED to consider allowing all of these children to, and I haven't officially done it yet, but I will, um, to um, allow them to have provisional approval um, for preschool services. That would allow all the early intervention children to remain, especially the children in July and August. And then the preschool administrators still have the authority to review the cases and make recommendations. If later on they determine a child doesn't need it, that's fine. That's their, um, their authority to do that. But this way it would protect the rights of all of these children. Um, and there's a lot of advocacy around this issue. There was advocacy around the issue for school age kids who were turning 21. And last Friday, SED issued guidance allowing all children who were 21 who either didn't graduate high school or didn't transition properly to adult services to basically go to school again next year. So we think that they've established this precedent. So um, later today, I will um, send this request up. I'm going to reach out to a member of the Board of Regents also to see if we can um, make this an urgent issue that maybe they can address. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thanks for your advocacy, Chris. No, we appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I, I think I think the other thing is is that um, from my perspective, when the New York City-based advocacy letter got sent to the governor's office, my understanding is that it got attention. Now, what that means, mm -hmm. I don't I don't entirely know. But I think that if we can just keep the pressure on, I think what I will say is this: in New York City, the June 30th children, the children that were in that pocket, I, we've been working very closely with providers and with DOE. We think we're going to be able to do it, honestly. However, that may not be the case in the rest of the state. That's number one. And number two is, we still, and Kathy can, Kathy talks about this all the time, but we still, what about the July children who are turning three in July? So I think that there's, you know, we, we're, we're a very large system. You know, EI is a large system, you know, CPSC is a large system. And I think we're, we're trying our best, but we need, we, we need the state to, to help us at this point. Thank you. This is great news. And, Again, Lydia, thanks for your leadership on pushing for these. It's impressive. I mean, I think we're I think we're all kind of working together. We don't want to see, you know, uh, we don't want to see children suffer because because of because of the pandemic. We're already providing teletherapy, so I mean, we're it's 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 a lot, and I think that um, you know, if this is not the moment where we're all going to kind of advocate together, then, then such a moment doesn't exist. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That's enough of that. Okay. All right. Let's, um, okay, let's move on. That, that was all really from the provider capacity work group. But I will say to you in full transparency that the State Department of Health did have a conversation around capacity and around um, what they described as, you know, safety issues, um, you know, around why certain therapists don't want to go into uh, communities. And 
they um, had a conversation with New Jersey about various efforts that New Jersey was making about, you know, kind of sending maybe escorts with therapists to, to, to go to accompany them. And um, that proposal got a very, um, I think, an appropriate response from the SEICC, which said that um, we don't believe that that is really the issue here, that the real issue of the therapist not going into uh, communities of color is because of implicit bias, and we need to do more to address structural racism issues as opposed to potentially implementing a policy that perpetuates structural racism in, in, in early intervention. So it was, it, it kind of became, a, it became a, a tense uh, conversation, but as the LEICC, I, I had to share that with you. Um, from a New York City standpoint, we wouldn't support such a proposal because we're trying to address systemic inequity and structural racism, and this is not necessarily the way that we should do that, right? Um, but I, I didn't put it on the slide because I didn't want to breathe life into it, really. Uh, but I, I do feel like I need to, to say that because it, it did get some attention <clears throat> at the at the SEICC. Okay. And I, I just wanted to just um, add, in terms of the teletherapy model and the idea of trying to, to make it a permanent um, service um, within early intervention. I do think it's really important um, for people to know that there are families who are getting services now in underserved communities because of teletherapy who weren't getting it before. Um, and that's a really significant, um, significant achievement, I think, in New York City for kids who are getting service that didn't get it before. There's a lot of challenges with it. I get it. But it is something I think, in terms of advocacy strategy, that's really important to point out to people. I agree. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Kara Chambers. Can I jump in for a moment? Of course. I just wanted to. Um, I think I've said this before um, in this venue, but I just want to remind folks that if we do move to more of a uh, uh, making teletherapy more of a permanent option. I think that the agency needs to think about ways to make technology and internet service available to the families that they serve. Um, not every family has the um, devices in their home and the internet access that they need, or they're running down minutes on their phone, which is incredibly expensive um, in order to access those services. So just like the Department of Education has provided um, Wi-Fi enabled devices, to use to enable them to access remote learning. I think that the early intervention system needs to consider doing that um, for families that otherwise wouldn't have access if this is going to move to a more permanent um, uh, model. We, we totally agree. You know, um, we, you know and, and there are potentially systemic ways to, to achieve that, but it, it's going to take some discussion you know, about what is the best way to advocate for something like that to happen? You know, do we, do we, cre do we have an entity that can sort of distribute these devices for us? Or is it something that gets built into potentially a rate or something like that? I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to, to work this out. But I think that we we uh, would not want to see teletherapy be permanently available if there wasn't also a technology solution that went along with it. So thank you for that. Anyone else? No other questions? Lydia, you're continuing? Okay, so um, I want to sort of get into get into the next presentation. Um, it's really divided into two parts. One is modifications that we've made to the early intervention program because of COVID, and two, how are what how are we 
slowly and methodically moving toward a system that, uh, that allows us to have both teletherapy right now, as well as an in-person service option. So, um, as you all know, early intervention was deemed to be an essential service by New York State during COVID-19. Um, and in order to ensure the availability of early intervention services in New York City, keep children, families, providers, and our own staff safe, and reduce the commit community transmission of COVID-19, we converted all of our functions to remote operations. That includes processing referrals, assigning service coordinators, conducting quality reviews of evaluations, still continuing to ensure families have access to their due process rights, and conducting individualized family service planning meetings. Um, as of March, 24th, but let me step back. March 18th is when the state put out their guidance saying you can do teletherapy. And so between March 18th and March 24th, New York City, we furiously scrambled to put together guidance on what that is going to look like um, for providers, for evaluations, and for services. And I think we did a pretty good job um, given the turnaround, and I, and I really want to commend our clinical team. Um, Dr. Canary and Faith Schreiber, Jeanette Gong, and all and the entire ESU team for what they did in putting together that guidance. Um, you know, so so that March 24th, we said, okay, because at that point we were really seeing some intense peaks in numbers in our local health metrics, we basically began to utilize a teletherapy approach exclusively. So this included all service coordination meetings with families were either by phone or other remote options. Evaluations started to be uh, done, you know, uh, remotely as well. And early intervention, therapeutic and educational services uh, were delivered using teletherapy, utilizing a family-centered approach. So in order to facilitate this shift, this is just some of what we did. And basically, this very, very wordy slide, and I'm sorry, um, this slide is basically the rest of the LEICC meeting. Okay, so in order to facilitate this shift, we developed and disseminated operational guidance, changed a good amount of our standing policies and procedures, and we issued extensive clinical guidance. And Kathy Canary, our medical director, is going to be talking about the clinical guidance that we issued. We provided technical assistance. We continue to provide technical assistance. Our provider oversight, we made a conscious decision. Our provider oversight activity shifted from on-site monitoring of early intervention providers to quality assurance work which was really contacting families that are in our system to verify that they were receiving early intervention services utilizing teletherapy and talking to families about what their experience was like. And Patricia is gonna be presenting to you on the results that we have called over 4,000 families at this point. We were also, through our data, monitoring the trends in EI referrals, evaluations, and IFSP meetings. That is going to be what Nora um, is going to be presenting on. And in response to the referral trends that we were seeing, which we're going to talk to you all about, we con made continuous outreach efforts at all levels, starting from myself down to our directors and our dedicated outreach team uh, to ensure that systems and doctors were aware that we are an essential service and that we are here and that we are in fact open for business. Um, okay. So how are we going to resume in-person service delivery after COVID-19 restrictions are relaxed? You realize I say relaxed because they're not lifted. So we have to right now is kind of a very 
critical moment for us as a as a program and as a service delivery system because we need to operate in a way that takes certain precautions into account but both the department the bureau and the provider community uh, we're all working together to ensure that we could reopen and deliver service in a safe and appropriate way um, so the plan that we released two days ago I don't know, two days ago, three days ago. Um, basically, what we decided to do is we decided to follow the New York, the New York State forward phases because we thought that would make the most amount of sense um, because that, and that is what people are most aware of. The other thing, the other principle here is that teletherapy services and evaluations remain an option, an open option. And in fact, for now, it's a preferred option because we realize that as a system, we need to be flexible right now. Because what might happen is that the, a family or families may need to go between in-person and teletherapy services, maybe because based on the health status of a team member, health status of the child or another family member in the household, and potentially also other health metrics and updated guidance that may be issued by the department, by the state or by the CDC. And so that's really why the plan that we put out sort of looks and feels the way that it does. And this was really based on a lot of conversations that we had with providers that told us, um, you know, we can't just stop. <laughs> you know, we can't just stop all teletherapy and go all in person. And, you know, we, we the department, we agree with that because we, our system is too big to just think that you can flip a light switch and have something happen automatically. Okay, so, and I will tell you that we are approaching phase three in early July. Um, so phase one, teletherapy only. Phase two, and what we thought would be appropriate right now is one time individual facility based to conduct hearing tests and evaluations to determine specific assistive technology devices, and also one-time home or facility-based visits for the purpose of fitting a child for assistive technology or assembly of an assistive technology device. Because as you know, assist, some assistive tech is not, you, doesn't need any sort of customization. And so, okay, the child needs it, you can send it, have a teletherapy visit, okay, it kind of works. But for those devices that need assembly, fitting, molding, something like that, you need an in-person visit. And so we felt like it was really important to start this work because it tends to take a long time and we don't want those children aging, you know, same concerns. So that is what phase two looks like. Phase three, um, we are obviously making allowances for home and community-based early intervention services. Um, multidisciplinary evaluations and also supplemental evaluations, as well as individual facility-based services. Phase four, we are still, um, we are thinking that perhaps groups will resume in phase four, but we are awaiting further guidance from the New York City Department of Health Bureau of Child Care because we, we, we are going to ensure that all of our child care providers, um, excuse me, sorry, that all of our child care providers is, are going to be in alignment with state guidance as well as local guidance from the Bureau of Child Care. Um, now, just to, sort of talk about uh, what this is gonna look like some more. So at the start of the applicable New York State phase forward phase, early intervention service coordinators are required to call all of the families on their caseload and notify them that early intervention services are delivered using teletherapy approach to the maximum extent possible still, but, and why, but, you know, in-person services are now available. However, parents are required to sign a consent and follow 
some protocols to ensure the health and safety of everybody in the household themselves, including early intervention providers, as required by, New York, by the New York City Department of Health. And um, again, in order to promote flexibility, we are still asking that the consent, if a family is going to re-initiate in person, they sign the consent to initiate re to re resume in-person services, but that they also sign the consent for teletherapy so that if something happens, that we as a system can, and the therapist can go back and forth between service methods, right? We, because if something happens, some, someone in the home is exposed, right away, that's 14 days. No services. So, right, we want to eliminate gaps or potential gaps to the maximum extent possible. Um, so, all early intervention providers are required and are working on putting plans in place that comply with this guidance. And I just want to, the guidance document is super long, so please read it. Um, this presentation is not in lieu of it in any way, shape, or form, but I wanted to bring up some things that I think are important to mention here because I want to um, make sure that everybody understands that, you know, we've really thought through all of this, and this has been uh, reviewed by the Department of Health uh, experts. In, in terms of um, in terms of COVID, so one, there there are face covering requirements, right? So the therapist has to wear a face covering, and everybody who was participating in the session is also has to wear a face covering. The child, the EI child getting the therapy, does not have to wear a face cover, and that is in line with other guidance that has come out, particularly around childcare. So thank you, Simone. Um, anybody who is not participating in the session does not have to wear a face cover, but they have to stay six feet away and no practice physical distancing, okay? Hand hygiene has always been required in EI. Everybody has to wash their hands before and after. We also did put out that if a therapist is going to be doing some more hands-on um, intervention, that they consider wearing gloves. If they don't wear gloves, it's not the end of the world as long as they're practicing appropriate hand washing. But we, if you are really interacting in that way, it is a recommendation. Now, we actually, yesterday, we got a, um, we got a question, a new, a new Han came out, and it said that people entering healthcare facilities have to wear goggles and face shields. So, of course, we were asked if that applies to EI. The answer is no. The reason that it doesn't apply to early intervention is because EI therapists are not going into clinical settings where they're interacting with sick people right, that they're, where they're interacting with people who have COVID. So that is why that doesn't apply to EI uh, therapists. So the next precaution, the next precaution is um, toys and other materials. The practice of bringing toys and other materials except paper into home and community-based settings is prohibited. Um, and we have put out an excellent guide about how to use materials found in the home, um, which supports best practice yet again, um, while delivering early intervention sessions. And we have, it's a very long document again because it's divided up by developmental milestones. So please make sure that your providers have access to it and see it. Obviously the document goes through a slew of protocols around cleaning, disinfecting, ventilation, running your water systems before you come back, um, you know, to, to a building where nobody was in for, let's say, the last quarter, which we're, we're, a lot of us are in that boat. In addition, there is a mandatory screening protocol 
We want all providers to implement that with their own staff, with their office staff, with their therapists, and also with families. That there is ongoing self-monitoring, because now people are going to start going into the community and providing services. That's going to be more important now than ever before, but also part of the consent for us going into the family's home is that the family has to commit to doing it also. That way, the entire system is working together to ensure that we can resume the delivery of early intervention services in a safe way, and we continue to mitigate the, any kind of community transmission of COVID. Um, all of these documents are posted on the early, inter early intervention website on our uh, front page in the COVID precaution box. So please go ahead. Some of the links weren't working. Somebody told me on one of the documents, so apologies for that. The, link, the document that's posted online, all of the links work. Does anybody want to, I'm done with this, with this presentation. Does anybody want to, Chris? Yes. So I do want to just um, really publicly thank you, Lydia, for all of your leadership. Um, I can't tell you how much it's been appreciated by the provider community in terms of um, the willingness to talk to us, to answer our questions. And I think um, on behalf of the Bureau, all of the guidance that's been written has been incredibly helpful, very well written, very, um, very well understood by the community. So I think, you know, all of those things are really important. And I think that from the beginning, you have absolutely made a commitment to ensure that children get services. So thank you for all of that. Um, I just also just kind of want to um, comment on, on the plan. Um, I, I think that the really two key goals here is that clearly um, a goal is to keep all of the children, the families, and the staff safe. Um, and I think that that's really a very important message that will hopefully help ensure that um, both providers and families have some comfort level knowing that you have taken all precautions as long as they follow all the guidance that you've given. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the other um, piece that is really critical is that you are displaying a willingness to allow the flexibility for families to choose what makes sense for them. Um, you know, if they aren't comfortable that they can still have a teletherapy model. It's not all or nothing. Um, and I think that those messages are really important to get out to the community so that they understand that they do have options um, and that especially parents can feel that once we do reach phase four, if they want in person, um, they can absolutely um, have access to that. Yeah, I agree. Great, thanks, Chris. Any other comments? I'm wondering um, if I can ask a question. I'm wondering what our what our colleagues um, that who Kara or Yuri, what your perspective is about the effectiveness or usefulness of tel of a teletherapy model for children who are in foster care or you know who who are who are having that kind of experience. Is it is there a benefit there? Or I'm just, I'm just really interested in, in understanding from your system perspective what you think about that. Hi, Lydia. Can you hear me? I'm having some connectivity issues. Can hear you? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, from my perspective, I think that teletherapy is better than nothing, but that said, it is um, a far distant second choice to in-person therapy, um, particularly for a child who is in a foster home where the foster parent might not be well-trained or thoroughly invested in, uh, in doing a lot of the follow-up and receiving a lot of the type of training that can be done over um, during teletherapy sessions, I think it's very challenging. Foster parents often have multiple children in their homes and often don't have um, the time to devote to sitting in multiple sessions every week to, um, you know, to assist the child. And I think it's been really challenging for a lot of our foster, the foster parents that we work with to keep up with the early inter intervention services. It's been, it's been really hard. 
and quite di- quite a different experience for them than having a therapist come in and work hands on with the child. So, you know, if we're talking about the choice between having nothing or teletherapy, yes, teletherapy is better. But I do think that it is still incredibly burdensome for the foster parent. Um, And it is definitely a a far, far from ideal choice. I would just add two thoughts to that, if I if I may. Of course. so, I mean, one important point is, is I mean, is technology access, which we've talked about a lot, um, you know, provided that foster parents have access to the technology in order to be able to do teletherapy. Um, some of them don't, um, you know, and I think the DOE's widespread distribution of tablets helped, but um, there's sometimes not an overlap with the population that we're serving in EI and the population that DOE serves um, in terms of age levels of the students. Um, so, you know, making sure everybody, um, make it, so, you know, one, one pivotal question to ask even before we ask whether foster parents, you know, would prefer telehealth or not, or would benefit from it is, you know, whether they have the technological capacity to be able to do it. Um, the other point is, um, you know, um, I definitely agree with everything Kara said, but wanted to make the following caveat. Um, there may be some foster parents who actually prefer you know, teletherapy versus in-person therapy. It may not be um, a wide swath, but um, I suspect that there are some foster parents who are concerned about COVID health issues in terms of having people um, that um, aren't in their immediate family unit coming into their home, for example, um, if they're if they're you know traveling on public transportation, things like that. Um, you know, at, at the appropriate time, public health experts will tell us what they think the risks level, risk levels are with, you know, various forms of contact. But I think it's a very personal choice for parents and families as to whether or not they would like to allow somebody who's not in their immediate family unit into their home. Um, so while we, um, so I think the ideal, if we can, is making both available, you know, when the public health experts say that that's okay. Thanks for that. Can I, I just wanted to just add, um, I think the real challenge um, for teletherapy is for children who um, are on the autism spectrum who are getting ABA services. Um, a lot of those children are not, many of them were grouped you know, in centers um, and now they're um, getting a small percentage of what they were getting because the families just can't have their children sit in front of the screen. It's, Two, year, two and a half years old um, for, for the amount of time that they were getting. So I, I do think that's one that we've heard from a number of um, providers as well as some families that that's one of the areas where I think, um, you know, when in-person resumes, um, they're gonna want that, um, you know, as quickly as, as and safely as they can get it, I think. Mm-hmm. All right, that's a great point. Research does show the value of teletherapy. Lots of places are using it in, um, across the country, mm-hmm. particularly like speech and OT and these hard, yeah. hard, you know, rural communities and all that. So yeah. I think there's also that flexibility of doing it during dinner time. But your point, I think a lot of it is about the types of services that they're really needing, the, the frequency of services. But flexibility is key for the two. Mm-hmm. Yep. I agree. And, and I think that that's, part of what we are going to be looking at at uh, one of our later presentations when we talk about um, our next steps with evaluating telephone. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. So we're going to move on now to Dr. Canary. Hi, thanks. So um, Lydia, if you could give me the next slide, thanks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the clinical guidance, but before we go to that, I just wanted to mention briefly um, something, a topic that has come up and that is of concern for people who take care of little kids, and that's the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MISC as it's now called. This is a condition where different body parts or different organ systems can become inflamed. And not all of these organ systems are affected in the same child, but it can um, affect heart, lungs, kidneys, brain, uh, skin, eyes, or gastrointestinal organs. So as I said, not all children will have all of the same symptoms. 
um, a, a recent uh, webinar I attended uh, with folks from New York City um, said that most of the kids they had seen with it had four to five days of fever and severe abdominal pain. And those were the most uh, consistent findings across the board. The cause is unknown, but many of these children um, either had the SARS-CoV-2 virus or were around someone with COVID-19. Um, the vast majority of kids who've been diagnosed have gotten better with medical care. And I will say in the entire state of New York, I think the total number is about 150. So we're not talking about something that happens frequently. But obviously when it happens, it's serious. And Kathy, you're coming in and out. I'm sorry. Is there, is there a way you can get closer or, or turn up your, your speaker? I, apologies. Because we, we kind of heard, I, I missed the number. Sorry. 150, roughly 150 in New York. Sorry. Um, obviously, the health department is closely monitoring this. And the best prevention for families is to follow the guidelines that would prevent COVID-19 exposure. Hmm. We lost her. Okay, there you are. Can't hear me? I could make one comment on this topic if you want while we wait for Kathy. Please, please, um, go ahead. I, Kathy was, I, I heard Kathy saying this, but uh, I think to me two key points are that it, it's, it's, it's very rare. So 150 kids in the state, and we think that there were probably hundreds of thousands of the seroprevalence, um, which the antibody positivity rate in children is looks like it's over 30%. It was not a, a perfectly done study in terms of the selection of the sample. Maybe a slightly high estimate, but um, you know, it, there's probably hundreds of thousands of kids that had it and only 150 who presented with this illness. And then second thing is, um, though, they, though some of them were very sick, they got better with, I believe, only one exception. I think there was one child who passed away. Um, but uh, so it's a uh, relative to what we saw with in adults. It's, it's I think it's not something we all really worried about it, and it's a very uh, clinically unusual thing. But uh, but it's uh, it, from the point of view of the health of children, not that big a thing to worry about. Another key thing for this audience is that the vast majority of cases were children over five, um, so it's not affecting younger children much. Though that there were a, a handful of cases in younger children. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mary. So I think Kathy can can uh, continue. Um, Great. So if I could have the next slide, please. So, um, so as Lydia mentioned, the um, New York State Health Department issued or released some guidance on March 18th, which indicated that reimbursement was available for telehealth. And as she also said, we scrambled and put together some guidance around how to conduct EI evaluations and service sessions using a teletherapy method. Um, within like nine months of that, services converted to totally teletherapy, um, so that was very timely. Um, regardless of whether evaluations or services are given in person or remotely, um, all services and evals have to comply with public health law, uh, memoranda, clinical practice guidelines, and New York City policy and procedures for the early intervention program. So um, parents had to and still have to sign a consent for early intervention teletherapy. And we um, created a, a uh, checklist for service coordinators to help them explain teletherapy to parents and to talk about what was needed, including, as people have alluded to, the um, technology that's needed and their familiarity with video and audio, and um, the need to um, sign a consent. 
the consent had to be uploaded into the or in the child's integrated case in NICE. And if that obviously is a challenge if we're not doing services in person. And so um, workarounds were um, made so that if parents gave consent to use uh, email, then these consents could be um, given by text or email. Next. Once a parent signed consent for either an evaluation or a teletherapy service session, um, it was required that the either evaluator or the, uh, the therapist contact the family prior to the first session to talk about what would be expected. And some of the issues they would talk about would be where exactly the session would take place in the home. Like, is this going to happen at a dining room table with an iPad or on the living room floor? Um, they needed to talk about household items that would be needed since um, there's no evaluator coming in with a test kit or no uh, provider coming in with their own toys. Um, they would also plan with the parent if there was a particular time of day that would make sense. Uh, if there's an issue they were concerned about, like feeding, then one of the sessions might want to happen around mealtime. Also, um, they would want to, they would talk about testing the, um, you know, the, the internet and smart devices and all of that, as has been noted. Um, the clinical guidance provides detailed instructions about um, the components of an evaluation or about therapy sessions, but none of this was new. It was just elaborated on with a few um, points added that uh, folks needed to talk about um, what exactly they were doing as far as telehealth and how kids responded to that and whether they were able to be successful with that. Um, can everybody please put themselves who's not speaking on mute? We're getting a little bit of feedback. Thank you. So this is a checklist we created that just um, sort of um, operationalized the guidance around evaluations and sessions. Um, next slide. And it's uh, important to um, note, as um, Dr. Shannon already said, that um, teletherapy has, has been used successfully in a variety of other settings, as well as other states having used teletherapy to conduct early intervention. Um, research shows that teletherapy um, can increase workforce capacity. It provides flexibility for scheduling for parents and providers. It certainly can be as effective as in-person therapy. Uh, it provides cost savings for families and providers when you think about travel and parking and time and mileage. Um, it increases positive child outcomes and certainly um, parents have to be engaged in either the session or the evaluation and it, um, they report greater self-efficacy and empowerment. So the initial clinical guidance that went out on March 18th talked about evaluations and sessions. And then about four weeks later on April 13th, we added additional information and examples for ABA services to be how that could be provided, how um, providers could obtain discrete trial data, use positive reinforcers and prompts, um, information like that. The resource, um, the clinical guidance had an extensive um, resource section uh, with links to papers and videos about a whole variety of um, helpful resources that you can see here. One of the, um, what we consider in EI to be sort of a silver lining of the teletherapy approach is that these sessions require interventionists to use parent coaching and family-centered best practices to support parents as they try out strategies with their children. Um, and we've, you know, encouraged providers to, if they hadn't previously, to take the online training about implementing family-centered best practices. A final note, the requirements for session notes and progress notes were unchanged um, for teletherapy, and there was some guidance also provided about session notes. Any questions? I see that, Liz, you have your hand up, uh, and maybe from before, but even if it was from before, please, please speak. We're sorry that we missed it. Oh, no, it's fine. Um, I just wanted to make a comment on what um, Kara was talking about, and I believe, yes, telehealth has been working, and it's been good, a good substitute for in-person services, 
But um, I think we have to look at, too, because um, I know when my child was in EI, it was important to me that the service provider had a connection with him, that they, they um, made, made some connections in person, and for me to see how he reacted to that person and the dynamic between the two was very important to me. And if I didn't see that it was a good relationship, I would ask for someone else to come in. So I think being over a screen, I don't know, maybe it doesn't, it doesn't go away, but I don't know how you would get that same kind of a dynamic over a screen. And so I wanted to know also, um, if you are going to do the two, is it up to the service provider to um, determine how many times they'll do in-person versus telehealth? Or um, is it going to be like a standard that everyone needs to follow? Or is it up to just the family? Because just like you talked about with the systemic racism, like, Somebody might want to say, okay, I'm just going to do telehealth because I don't want to go over there and just choose to just do the telehealth when it's not in the best interest of that child. Maybe that child does need the person in, in, the, uh, in the home or in a situation where they can see them, feel them, you know, you know feel their energy, feel their, their warmth in, in that room. So that was just my, my personal. <laughs> no, that's, 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 very important. Um, I think you're raising some really important questions, Liz, and I think some of those questions we have yet to answer. You know, I think right now, the way, be, because right now, the way that teletherapy is being work, used is to mitigate COVID, right, and community transmission, it's going to have, it's going to be based on what the parent wants, and also what, what, the, what the general health situation is, right? So that's what it's going to be now. However, we are at a really critical point where we can make recommendations and really think through if we are going to have teletherapy available permanently, what should that be like? You are not the first person to share with me, you know, we may not want to have everything, Tele, telehealth, we may want that, you know, maybe initially there's a, man, a mandated in-person session or there's in-person sessions periodically spaced in between telehealth, teletherapy, sorry, visits, right? So I think there's a lot to think through and we are looking at the literature right now to see what it says because I think right now is the moment if we are in a position to shape what this is going to look like going forward, we have to keep everything that you're saying in mind. Does anybody Thank else? You. Welcome. Does anybody else want to make a comment to, to Kathy's uh, presentation? Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Jacqueline? Sorry, I was on mute. So thank you, Liz, for bringing that up. I think that's critical for us to always keep that in mind in our decisions. Um, we're going to have Nora present now. Good morning. So I'm very glad that we're here today because I know people have a lot of questions about what has been the impact on the program and participation in the last three months. And I've got some data to share with you about some of that, especially the upfront with referrals and evaluations, and then a little bit about IFSPs. And then after me, Patricia Pate is going to share some information that we've gained about what are services looking like right now. So I think that that will hopefully be helpful information. Um, and as you'll see, with each of the following slides, they're divided with sort of the first half being blue and the second pink. And we made that switchover point of being March 24th, which was the date that we switched to tele-evaluation or to teletherapy. But what you'll see is the drop-off started a little before that as people became more anxious about what was happening with COVID-19. Next slide, please. So here we're looking at uh, council referrals citywide. And the, the bars are 
2020, and that line above is what happened last year at the same time. So unsurprisingly, you can see that there was a massive drop originally. It was, you know, a more than 75% drop. And it has had pretty consistent improvement all the way through. That first month, I think people were very tense. And then it's gone up. And really, since then, the only slight drop off you see there uh, is Memorial Day. So I think that there were, were a couple pieces contributing to the increases. Um, one was as people started to realize this isn't going away tomorrow. I don't want to just put all, you know, put this off. My child needs this. Um, but one of them, too, was as Lydia mentioned earlier, you know, we did a lot of work to make sure that people realized. You know, New York State is on pause, but New York City early intervention is still here. And I think that that, that message did get out, took a little while. Next slide. So in terms of looking at that by race, um, one of the interesting things here actually that you see is that when you break it down by race, and we've never looked at it quite like this before, you can see that white families are just have a more volatile referral pattern overall. And so even this year, although it was lower, it was a little bit more up and down. Um, the other groups were a little bit more steadily consistent of the drop and then the increase up. Um, and it wasn't that much dramatically different um, across the groups. They all experienced at the, at the most extreme a drop of between 82 and 87 percent from last year. It was dramatic. Next slide. So we don't usually talk to the LAICC about multidisciplinary evaluations. It's a very operational thing in some ways. But in this context, we thought it was an indicator of a few things. One is just, you know, system capacity and child progress. But another one was also, you know, people's growing comfort level with tele-evaluation. So unsurprisingly, this is a count, I should say, of multidisciplinary evaluations establishing a child's eligibility as we get them. This is the moment of receipt. So you'll see that there's a delayed impact because we get things several days after the evaluation was actually conducted. And so they don't, you don't see that first dramatic drop as you did with referrals, but there's certainly a big drop. Um, but as you can see, whereas it was mentioned earlier that CPSC evaluation stopped for some time, ours never completely went away. So with this one, we're seeing, we're seeing more of a steady increase, and it really hasn't gone up as much the way um, the referrals maybe have. And I want to go to the next slide, and there's a little bit more breakdown there, which is looking at it by race. So what you can see here is that there was a little bit more variation in the impact by race than there was, by, um, than it was for referral. Um, and, but most of them in the end, we are still consistently, as of the last month, really down about 50% from last year. But that's still significantly better than, you know, some of the, the major lows there were, were close to, um, close to 85% at, at the worst point. And it ranged with, um, with the drop being, I think, the greatest actually for uh, Latinos. Next slide. So IFSP meetings, this includes both initial and ongoing. Um, and this is something we normally look at just as a, a thought about productivity for ourselves. Um, but here we also are just thinking about are families still staying engaged? Are they still you know, wanting to make sure they're on top of their services? And we can see that they really are. Um, the drop here is nowhere near as dramatic as it is for referrals and evaluations. Um, and it's, it's been pretty consistent. And what you don't see here, but will come up a little bit later, is um, our, our, we are required to get from referral to initial IFSP in 45 days. And not only are we having good volume, we're actually having great timeliness, um, possibly better, definitely better than usual. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But the one advantage to currently doing things um, by tele or video conference is that we don't have much of a cancellation rate anymore. And so we've really been able to effectively convene meetings even remotely. So on the next slide. And here we're looking at it by race. And again, it's the same racial patterns about whites being more volatile. 
Um, but what is interesting is that it's been, um, whites have been going pretty consistently up in the last month, and it looks like blacks and Asians have gone down slightly. So we'll have to take a look at what's going on there. Next slide. So again, this is something that we wouldn't necessarily normally share because it's very operational, but it's, it's definitely indicative right now. This is talking about the increase over last year in the number of days from referral to MDE submission. And you can see that COVID, televaluation, and all the associated challenges have definitely added a lot to the time it takes to get a child from referral to a completed and submitted evaluation. But if you go to the next slide, this is the decrease in the number of days from the MDE receipt to the meeting, which is down by four days, which is why we're meeting our 45-day mandate even more than before, um, and where we are able to catch up a little bit on that submission time. So again, this is the one boon here has been that, you know, being able to schedule and convene meetings has just really accelerated. So I'll take questions on that. Liz? Liz, did you have a question? Um, I didn't, but um, I do know. <laughs> um, I don't, uh, I wanted to know, um, did you take into consideration um, the essential workers and maybe the clients coming from that, of the, the children not having someone maybe that doesn't speak English in the house because the English person has, the, the English speaking person has to be at work or like, I don't know if that would impact the, um, the results in any way. It absolutely would because they're not really results. They're really just counts. And I don't have any way in the data to know that the primary caretaker is a first responder. So you're absolutely right. Like what is driving each individual case? You're right. It could be many things. Um, like you just said, like, you know, are there language issues? It's, there's many, many possible factors, but those kind of things we can't really get at so well just through data because we don't collect that kind of information from families. Chris, did you have your hand up? I, I just I just wanted to um, ask Nora. I, I think that part of the referral issue um, has probably been the fact that most of the doctor's offices have been closed um, and they probably um, have started to, you know, um, see kids again. And I know that there's a very strong um, concern around children whose immunizations have lagged because they haven't been in the doctor's offices. But I also um, think that, you know, a developmental screen um, really should be a priority um, in regards to um, when a pediatrician now sees a child for the first time in like maybe three months, even if it is remotely, um, and I have, you know, made that sort of suggestion to DOH at the state level. Um, I'm just wondering if you've um, either outreach to these pediatricians or other people and kind of just try to, you know, um, encourage this, this um, screening. From a from a from a bureau standpoint, we we have been uh, doing outreach to our uh, community partners. Um, really since we saw this this decline uh, in since we saw this decline however the the issue still remains that you know systemic work needs to happen to promote um, developmental screening mm -hmm. right and we think that developmental screening with the use of an established screening tool is far superior than doing development ad hoc developmental surveillance because using a screening tool is more objective and it's going to equalize right balance out the number of children that are coming into this program based on an objective measure and metric rather than potentially a healthcare provider's subjective perceptions on how a particular child is or potentially should be developing. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, while there have been uh, billing codes established for developmental screening, I, and, and I also will say that there are healthcare systems, and I think maybe Mary can talk about it, that are really being more deliberate about ensuring that 
developmental um, screening is taking place. I'm wondering, Mary, can you share with us sort of what's going on um, at H and H with 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 screenings uh, in general? Uh, yeah. So um, first, on the question of related to the uh, COVID challenges that we're facing, which are very similar to the ones that you're facing, the kinds of restructuring and moving to part teletherapy and part in person, and how to make the balance of those things, and how we're, I think everybody is prioritizing visits for children uh, under two, and uh, developmental screening and surveillance is one of the reasons. Um, everybody, certainly that's true of the population. I think it is true across the, the region. I think a key thing to know, though, is that a huge number of practices have just closed. So something like 50% of services, pediatric services, are delivered by a myriad of small private practices that take uh, Medicaid and Medicaid managed care. And th many of those practices were part-time things, and, and many of them are not open. Um, so that's a challenge. Um, and I think families are a little paralyzed by what to do. They want to wait for their person because they have, they like them. Um, there's a the whole business of changing your primary care provider on the insurance, which feels like a big step to take away from the person that you're with if you want to go to another place. Um, we have at Health and Hospitals um, waived the requirement for the PCP to be changed. So we will see for, in that age group for vaccines, but we would see them for, we would do a full visit, um, any child with any insurance. Um, that wants to come to health and hospital for a well check because they're behind. It is vaccine focused, but it just gives them that age group in for a visit. But um, statewide, there's been a lot of talk over the last couple of years about developmental screening and uh, making that a quality measure because that is what one of the things that drives us to better practice or to that type of especially better practice is that we get uh, recognized for doing the extra work. Because um, we need support, we need to have the medical systems and other things from our system. So it, you know, we have to convince the people that are allocating resources that this is something worthy of allocating resources to. So the state is trying to figure out how to do that, and they're struggling with uh, diagnosis codes. And they, they can't basically they can't figure out how to measure whether or not we have or haven't done a structured screen. And they're working on it. It's not an unsolvable problem, but it is a little bit of a complicated problem. Um, and I think at New York Health and Hospitals, we have um, made strides and are about to start. We would have started it by now, but it's a little bit delayed by COVID. So working with our EMR and working with this now coalition of all the sites that are working together around some of these issues, we have everybody committed to doing either the SWIC or the ASQ3 uh, at the 9, 18, and 30 months visits with a methodology for tracking whether it was done to, in order to give feedback to people just to, and, and hopefully help them get the support that they need to do it. Um, and, and I would say, though, I agree with you that structured screens uh, are a necessary balance to the downside of developmental surveillance, that, you know, structured tests have their faults too. But, um, looking at the admissions test for high schools as an example, they're not, you know, they're objective, but when it comes out, they are, in fact, reinforced biases as well. I think we need the structured screens, but I wouldn't let go of developmental surveillance. I think that's also important. Just that every visit should be talking about development, and then we should have these screens to make sure that we don't make it better. And I think that that perspective is gaining traction. And um, so in brief, at health and hospitals, we should be doing this in a system model flow by the fall. Um, and New York State is working on making it a quality measure so that it's something that the managed care companies push the uh, practices to do. Um, but the COVID problem is a lot of practices that are closed. Um, if we can get kids just in, even for a vaccine business, I think a lot of them will get screened. And it's, um, it's kind of, a, I think we should see that as a joint effort. Thank, thanks for that, Mary. And, and I think, thank you for the context as well. I mean, it's, it's really good to know from sort of an, an advocacy standpoint for, for us in terms of, you know, who are the right folks to talk to? I mean, I certainly think that, you know, the development of a quality measure around this particular issue is um, very important in terms of ensuring that more children are routinely um, properly screened and, um, and receive surveillance, but screened in order to ensure that 
more more children are getting appropriate access to early intervention if, if they if they need it. I actually I think the more advocacy that, that you can do in the settings where you are at the state level, just to mention even just to mention as an important thing will help because we're in a resource crunch and so conversations which have opened up around resources for pediatrics feel like they're closing down again as everybody's in survival mode so they want to go they're going back to the old mechanism which really under resourced uh pediatric care yeah no you're right yeah so i also think advocating in addition to advocating pediatricians be, being able to do this is child care workers right who have access to children regularly. So, and ideally, which was, has been talked about in the first thousand days, if we had a, a data system similar to the immunization registries, where if a child care provider did a developmental screen, or if I do a developmental screen, we could each see it, see the results. Um, that's, you know, some places have that. Rhode Island has it. Oh, wow. So, that's a, a it's, you know, it's, again, it's not it's not a simple thing to do, but that getting that on the agenda would help. Yeah, no, that's wow, that's terrific that they're doing it there. But yes, I agree. Any other questions, anyone or comments? All right. So let's move on to Patricia. Monitoring. Where's Patricia Shiani? Okay. How about now? Can you all hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. Sorry about that. So as you know, our primary method of monitoring for compliance for a number of years now has been the on-site visit when we examine individual children's files. But of course, when the pandemic hit, we suspended all of those on-site activities. And in early April, we shifted to more of a quality assurance method and what we have been doing since then is calling a random sample of families who have current IFSPs. And what I'm going to do is to speak briefly about what we have found so far. So the calls are conducted using a standardized questionnaire. They're very short. And we find that uh, about 80% of families that we can get a hold of agree to uh, have us conduct the survey, so we're getting a really good response with the families. The purpose of the call is very simple. Are authorized services being provided? If they're not uh, service type by service type, we work with them to ascertain, was this something that the family chose? Was this something connected to a technology limitation? Or is this a provider issue? Our concern with that middle one there, and I've heard it reflected a bit already today, is twofold. Is it about access to connect to the internet, or is it about hardware? So let's take a look at what we've seen so far. So far, uh, as of the end of last week, we had called 4,833 families. We average uh, surveys with families at a rate of about 800 a week. All in all, so far, we've done about 28% of our entire service population. And this is what we found so far. 76% of the families report that they are getting service in all service types or service in some of their service types. 24% of the families are not receiving services at all in any service type. And it surprised us a bit, but as you can see, 79% of families of the ones who are getting nothing tell us very clearly that it is at their choice. There's a variety of reasons why, that they cite for their choice. Most of them, though, cluster around some sort of family time capacity. 
They literally don't have the hours. And the second family choice issue that we hear the most is their perception of teletherapy. 14% of the families who aren't receiving anything tell us it's because of issues related to a provider or what a provider has told them. And 7% cited technology concerns for the reason that they weren't getting any type of services. So that's either access to the internet or the hardware. To break this down a little bit further, there's uh, the group that we were interested in are those who are getting service in some service types, but not in others. So they're getting some of their services, but not all. And so when we look at the types of reasons they gave us, they're very clear. There are some service types that work well for their families via therapy, and then they tell us others don't. The interesting thing, though, is there is no consistency as to which one. So it's not as though everybody says OT works, but PT doesn't. It's just we, we get just as many people who say ABA is fantastic through teletherapy as we get people who say ABA is hard to do through teletherapy. So there's no across the board uh, type of service that works better or worse than any other. Another reason they say that they're not getting all of their approved service types is simply time. They can do some but not others and they have prioritized certain ones. Some families report though that service coordinators or therapists have discouraged them from pursuing teletherapy. And when we hear that, of course, we try to help them out with their understanding and get them hooked up with services. This last one is really important. Overall, out of these 4,833 calls that we've made, we've only run across a total of 85 families that have issues related to technology. And a big chunk of the time is that they have the internet and they have devices, but they have too many people trying to get onto few devices. But a lack of technology is clearly not uh, a large impact on, on the amount of services families feel like they can access. We continue to make calls. Um, again, it's somewhere between 600 and 800 a week. Uh, and as we get more results, uh, I would assume that they'll make me come back. Any questions? We will make you come back. All right. The boss has spoken. I'll be back. <laughs> but, but I think that this is one of the one of the metrics that we are going to utilize in terms of, you know, our advocacy and what we put forward. But also we thought that it was very important to make sure that we are connecting to families during this difficult time. Patricia, can you share um, what what other things are sort of coming up in, in these in these phone calls, you know, and I mean, I'm kind of curious as to why your hit rate is so good, like why are families, you know, why are so many families wanting to talk to the Department of Health during this time? I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that. Well, I think when the Department of Health calls in the middle of a pandemic, people usually do want to pick up the phone and talk to us, so that helps. People are home, uh, so that helps. We're also very persistent. So, for instance, the woman who, uh, Layla, who does all of our uh, Spanish-speaking families, she doesn't stop at three attempts. She will call them over and over and over again, including in the evening, until she gets someone. We also stay true to our word. We tell them, this is a very short survey, and we average less than five minutes on the phone with anybody. So I think that has helped a lot. Um, and the most common response, people are glad that the government has called and somebody cares about them, which sounds so cliche, but it's absolutely true. Chris, did you wanna, you had your hand up? I just wanted, I, I, actually maybe not anymore because Patricia just said she's keeping them short, 
but I'm just wondering if you want to start to maybe ask families about the resumption of services um, and maybe start to get some feedback from them in regard to what their thinking is. Because I know a number of like our education providers are starting to do that. Our adult service providers are starting to do that. Um, maybe like one or two questions, just simple kind of things. Um, it might help inform you moving forward. Yeah. Good. Good point. So, so the good news with starting uh, a sh with a short survey means that we can indeed add questions to it as time goes on. Uh, so I have no doubt uh, that we'll be adding to it at some point because I can see Lydia looking at me with that in her eyes. So we'll, we, we'll see. We'll take it back. I mean, we did. We do want to. Um, really keep this targeted to achieve a certain end and make a certain point with 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 some of this so but we will we'll talk to to Patricia and, and Nora's teams to see sort of um, how we can best move this forward and if we really want to modify the survey midstream anybody else any questions for Patricia no all right Okay. All right. We'll move on to Dr. McVeigh. Yes. So before we, uh, before Tina does her presentation, I want to introduce you to her. Uh, Tina is our new um, director of early intervention research and analysis, and we are so very happy that she's joined our bureau. She has been with the department um, since 2002, and she has been the principal investigator on a lot of really critical early childhood work, including the longitudinal study of early uh, development, which was a, which created a data linkage across a data set for EI, DOE, birth and death certificates, and the lead registry, the DOHMH Zika-related birth defects study, the NYC Kids Telephone Survey uh, 20, of 2017 and 2019, and the New York City Macroscope Electronic Health Record Surveillance System Chart Review Validation Study. Tina got her education, got her PhD in measurement, evaluation, and statistics in educational psychology from Columbia University uh, Teachers College and her MPH in Population and Family Health from Columbia University School of Public Health. So welcome, Tina, to your first AICC meeting, the first of many, I hope. Um, and I will turn it over to you uh, for your presentation in family experience with EI teletherapy. Thank you, Lydia. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be with all of you today. Um, as part of the EI program, the response to COVID-19, uh, as we've been talking about, um, general services rapidly, can you hear me? Yes. Rapidly transitioned from in-person to teletherapy mode without uh, planning and piloting and training and so forth that would have happened for that kind of transition under normal circumstances. Um, but now that we've succeeded in affecting this transition and have about 75% of families who received in-person services in March having received at least one teletherapy service, um, we want to learn more about family and provider experience with and perceptions of teletherapy. And it's terrific that Patricia's team has been able to do these five-minute surveys, um, but we want to know more expansively um, about these experiences. So we're planning surveys uh, that will be um, on the internet uh, that, with families, intervention, interventionists, and provider agencies to learn about the challenges and successes of teletherapy and suggestions for improvement. Um, the parent survey is the furthest along in development, um, and so I'm going to focus on describing some of the content of that survey um, to you today. 
so the parent survey has a section on background, which is very brief um, and will be used mostly to help interpret some of the findings. Um, then there's a section about experience with technology, which um, is similar to what Patricia's group has been doing. Uh, and then families' perceptions of teletherapy as a mode for delivering general services. And uh, questions about EI teletherapy in the future. So some of these themes have been part of today's conversation. Um, now that you have the big picture, I'll share some of the draft uh, parent survey questions with you. Next slide, please. Um, so the experience of te technology section um, asks about the devices that the families use, um, and they can select as many as they use, uh, about how difficult video conferencing hardware and software were to use initially and now after the family has gained some experience with it. Um, I should say the family and the therapist. <laughs> um, and then this question here that you see on the slide, which is really asking them to endorse um, the biggest challenges that they've faced in transitioning to teletherapy um, or the, the biggest technology uh, challenges. Next slide, please. So we've been talking a bit about parent coaching um, and the EI program does very much recommend uh, embedded coaching model and approach to delivery of services. Um, but we know that that is not necessarily the model that's implemented in the field. And so um, we hypothesize that for therapists who've been using primarily the embedded coaching model throughout their work with a family, the transition to teletherapy would be less jarring than for families where the EI service that was delivered was delivered directly to the child. Um, and so uh, we ask about whether or not the extent or the balance between the therapist working directly with the child and uh, mostly coaching the parent, um, which will be, I think, a very interesting um, it will be interesting to see those responses and also to interpret the uh, perceptions about teletherapy as a model stratified by the parent coaching. Um, so then for each of the four general service types, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language therapy, and special instruction, we ask a series of about six questions, I believe. Some are, you know, multiple choice, yes, no, and then others are more general and open-ended. So um, the top two questions are examples of some of the multiple choice or Likert scale kind of questions that we ask to get at dimensions of parental perception of therapy quality in the EI, in the EI teletherapy context. And then um, open-ended questions about the advantages and disadvantages of teletherapy for you and your child, which might simply be scheduling um, or things that, um, that are more peripheral to the quality and content of the service itself, but may have big impacts to the family. Next slide, please. And then, um, you know, as we were talking about with this, this period of having both in-person and teletherapy, um, we really want to explore what parental preferences are around this hybrid of teletherapy and in-person ther in in therapy. So um, I think this question will really get at mm -hmm. uh, what that is. Um, and then being able to look at that by how long the family has been in therapy and that kind of thing um, will be helpful. And then we're thinking about some of the opportunities with teletherapy that we haven't really tapped into in this emergency period, but are potentials for the future. Um, so one of that, though, and, and this may be happening in some situations, 
but for the therapist and the parent to explore online resources together. So we want to know whether this is something that parents welcome. Um, and then secondly, uh, the technology enables recordings. And so, and those could be either to share with the family or to be used for quality assurance review um, by provider agencies or the EI program itself. And so here are two questions that we're asking about that um, in terms of whether whether the families uh, welcome this online review of educational materials and whether they would like to receive recordings of their child's EI teletherapy sessions to review between appointments. And so I think as we think about what a service model might look at look like if, if we're thinking about the resources and we've got perhaps an in-person session with some frequency and then um, a, telether a, record a teletherapy session with another frequency that's recorded, then maybe the family would just take that recorded session and review it throughout the week instead of having another session or something like that. So the information that families pr provide us about the acceptability of these recorded sessions, I think will be very helpful for us as we think about um, what kind of service configurations we might want to offer going forward. So going on to next steps, um, I've just reviewed with you some of the items that we are uh, thinking about including in our parent survey. Um, and we have a rough, rough draft of a survey for interventionists that roughly follows the same themes of sort of background technology problems, the therapeutic sessions themselves, and preferences for the future. Um, but that is in a much rougher stage and is, uh, will be subject to much more development going forward. And then um, we also, as we're thinking about whatever gets built out, um, we'll want to engage with provider uh, agencies and uh, survey or uh, otherwise um, <clears throat> obtain their input as to what future models should look like. Um, once each survey is approved internally, it will be uh, shared with the LEICC for uh, comment and review. Um, and then when everything is signed, sealed, and delivered, we will implement the surveys online uh, by either texting or emailing the link to families um, or providers or agencies. Uh, and then uh, conduct outreach to encourage families and providers to participate. And I believe Patricia's group may already be softening the ground for this by just letting families that they talk to know um, that they will be receiving an internet survey in the future. Um, so that is that. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I want to just make a comment. This is Jacqueline. Um, this is terrific, Tina. I'm really excited to hear about the details of how you're thinking about this. And just even the idea of the video sessions is a, is a possibility. And it made me think um, there's a lot of, uh, there are programs that do parent child dyadic work using videos as a way to support parents' relationships with their children. And this, made me think, you know, this is possibilities where we can use it as a way to, you know, they, they can use it also even as an intervention, the therapist, to sort of show parents strengths of what they did with their child and how they were engaging with them, and even themselves. So allowing therapists to sort of re-review it and look at it and see, ooh, what I, you know, how they can build on, you know, again, their strengths or whatever. So it was a great, anyway, this is an added comment of ways to think about that how it can be used, utilized in multiple ways if families are comfortable having those 
video taped sessions. Yeah. Uh, and so for us, the next steps, we will draft the, you know, surveys. We want to get your feedback. We're also, as we talked about before, we're also interested in sort of making, you know, sending them to the state as well. I, I know that there are other counties uh, that I've been talking to, Westchester, Nassau, Suffolk, that are also interested in doing similar kind of survey work. And so perhaps there will be some opportunities maybe for us to regionally say, okay, this is going to be the New York City survey, but, you know, we might decide, let's have some common items between counties and see, like, you know, what, what could that do um, in, terms of, in terms of all of that um, information that we can gather. Um, anybody else have any comments or questions? No. Okay. Um, we, we are, thank you, Tina. We are running up on our time, but we do have a uh, submitted a public comment that was submitted to us ahead of time on the internet. So, Aristellus, would you like to read it into the record? Sure. Um, my name is Paula Jordan, and I am the co Can you hear me? We can. We were getting a little feedback, though, but should be okay. Okay. My name is Paula Jordan, and I am the co-director of the Metropolitan Tyrant Center, a member of the New York Region One Tyrant Training and Information Center Collaborative, a fed federally funded project of the United States Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs. We provide training and information to families of children with disabilities, as well as the professionals that work with them throughout New York City and Long Island. In addition, I am a parent member of the New York State EICC. Today, I am presenting comments on my role at the Parent Center. On June 16, 2020, a group of organizations working to support children and families in New York State, including our Parent Center, sent an open letter to Governor Cuomo urging him to extend the deadline for children to receive early intervention services when they have been unable to receive preschool special education evaluations due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, we have not received an answer to our letter. We are deeply concerned that, that young children with developmental delays and disabilities across the state will experience a gap in services in violation of their legal rights. As per the guidance provided by New York City EI dated 6-22-20, New York City Early Intervention In-Person Service Delivery will resume once our city moves to phase three of reopening and based on what the mayor announced, this will happen early in July, a little too late for thousands of kids who are in limbo right now for the transition process. I am asking members of the LEICC to join us in the collective effort and contact Governor Cuomo and su support our request. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah Sellis. And I want to say that I am, we ran out of time. We got so enmeshed in all of this COVID talk that our colleagues from the DOE didn't get an opportunity to present uh, with what we are, what the plans are for the um, document transfer system. But we will be emailing all of you with the next steps because that project, which I'm so relieved to say, and thank you to Jessica and to Caitlin. Uh, that project is moving forward, and I am very excited about continuing the work to to further smooth transition between our systems. Uh, we, I think, have already approached a couple of the LEICC members to help us um, do some user acceptance testing of this new system, and we're probably going to be coming to a couple more of you um to to ask for some more folks to to do user acceptance testing in addition um just to make a plug the second version of the ei to doe program guide has been uh released jessica uh caitlin can you where where is it has it been posted online yet yeah uh, okay. go ahead caitlin it's posted uh, both on our family-facing website, which is schools.nyc.gov, on the Moving to Preschool page, and it's posted in a number of places on our provider-facing info hub on the public pages there as well. So, we will we'll send out a, a notice to the field and to the LAICC 
that about exactly where it's located and any next steps. And I'm, I'm really sorry that we had to cut you your presentation short. Please forgive us. Totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lydia. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jacqueline, would you like to adjourn us? Uh, yes. Um, this, I wanted to also just, this will be my last session here as on the committee, and I want to thank all of you for your incredible leadership. And uh, work, it's been such an honor to be working with such a stellar group of um, colleagues and uh, scholars who have really been incredibly advocates for doing what's best for our children. And I, again, it's been a delight. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline, for you. chairing the LEICC. Thank you, Jacqueline. All right. All right. So I guess meeting is adjourned. Be we well. are adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Hope everyone has a good weekend. Bye-bye.